Thanks to at home for joining us this hour. Very happy to have you with us. Halfway through the week already. Where does the time go? Um, whether or not you regularly follow the trade war part of this presidency, whether or not that is part of the diet of Trump-related controversial news that you choose to partake in on a regular basis. And I realize everybody's got to sort of pick their own, you know, items out of the salad bar, right? You can't, you can't gorge on all this stuff every day. You sort of choose your stuff to a certain extent. Whoa. Even if you haven't been following the trade war, st trade war part of the Trump administration, if that hasn't been part of your regular diet of news about this president, odds are that you drive. Uh, or maybe even if you're not a regular driver, odds are that you spend some time in automobiles and you recognize the centrality of automobiles to American life and the American economy. Well, whether or not you have been paying any attention, any attention at all to Trump trade war stuff, one of the things you should know that the Trump administration appears poised to do and soon is that the president is apparently getting ready to make a unilateral presidential decision to hoik up the price of cars by several thousand dollars each. Um, President Trump has reportedly received from his Commerce Department a report that he requested, which gives him a national security pretext um, that, that lays out some sort of legalistic national security justification that is designed to allow him to make a solo decision to put big new taxes on imported cars, which would make them thousands of dollars more expensive. Politico reported today on the content of that secret report that has already been given to the White House. Uh, the content of that report has been speculated about for a long time. It seemed pretty clear that this was the direction that Trump was going with this. But now Politico today reports not only has that secret report been delivered to the White House, but it does as expected, give the president this national security pretext that he needs to be able to institute those taxes on his own. Now, the reason President Trump wants to do that, the reason he wants to uh, impose thousands of dollars of, in price hikes on cars is because he thinks this is a genius economic deal-making strategy against foreign countries. He apparently either doesn't care or doesn't believe that when he does this unilaterally to foreign-made cars, there he doesn't get or he doesn't believe or he is willing to call the bluff that there will be a similar reaction in all the other countries that we export American cars to. I mean, everybody who looks at this type of economic policy believes that if we do this to other countries, they will do the same to us. And that will have the ultimate effect of pitchforking the whole U.S. auto industry on which millions and millions and millions of American jobs depend. Not to mention what it's going to do to the price of cars uh, for everybody, regardless of whether or not you depend on the, jo the, the auto industry or any of its, um, uh, any of its subsidiary industries uh, for your own job. Nevertheless, the president loves this idea, and apparently this policy decision is in the works from this White House. Now, regardless of what you think of this as a policy idea, regardless of whether you think it is a good idea to do this to the price of cars on purpose, one major consequence of this right now, which could matter for everything in this administration, is that the Republicans in Congress, and particularly Republicans in the Senate, are reportedly mad about this. And they're mad about this, A, because they don't want these tariffs on cars, uh, but B, they want to see this secret report that has been provided to the White House, produced by the U.S. Commerce Department, this report that reportedly gives Trump the legalistic national security justification he needs to be able to impose this policy on his own say-so. So Republicans in Congress, Republicans in the Senate have been demanding that they be allowed to see this report and the White House will not hand it over, and the Commerce Department will not hand it over. And the little miracle on the side of the road on this one is that apparently Republicans in Congress mind that. <laughs> they apparently care. They are reportedly even slightly mad about it, which these days is like a blue moon and a four-leaf clover and a hen's tooth all wrapped up in one. I mean, Republicans really don't mind anything when it comes to the Trump administration, but apparently they mind this. And that might become important, not just on the question of whether the president is going to unilaterally make all cars way more expensive, 
Um, it, it may really matter for everything. Tonight, the Wall Street Journal reports that new requests for documents and information are being prepared by the Judiciary Committee in Congress for a whole new bunch of people who have uh, not yet been targeted by these congressional investigations. People like Gary Cohn, the president's economic advisor, also the president's sometime lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, even Trump's uh, first secretary of state, Rex Tillerson. They're going to finally start asking questions of Rex Tillerson. I have questions for Rex Tillerson, too. Like, sir, for example, how did you get that job in the first place anyway? I would love to know. Um, now, even in this Wall Street Journal report, they're not suggesting that we have any information about what documents or what information are being requested from these folks. I should also mention that there's been pushback against this story tonight. Reporter Natasha Bertrand at The Atlantic is throwing a little bit of cold water on this story tonight, saying that her reporting indicates that any planned second wave of Judiciary Committee document requests isn't ready to go at this point, and the names reported by The Wall Street Journal tonight should not be seen as definitive targets of this committee. We've done some of our own reporting on this show that suggests that Natasha Bertrand's line here uh, may be correct. But whether or not this second wave of document requests is going out, <laughs> the first wave itself was pretty gigantic, right? 81 document requests from the Judiciary Committee alone. And I mean, everybody from the NRA to former White House official Steve Bannon to uh, the Trump inaugural committee to the Trump inaugural chairman Tom Barrick to at least one of the Russians who went to the Trump Tower meeting during the campaign. I mean, all of these entities that have received these document requests from the Judiciary Committee, a lot of them have started handing over documents to the committee. As this committee, led by Chairman Jerry Nadler, pursues multiple lines of inquiry about the Trump administration and the transition and the campaign. And it's not just these document requests. Next week, a week from today, we're expecting some public testimony, televised testimony, before the House Intelligence Committee from Felix Sater, who, among other things, worked on the Trump Tower Moscow project during the campaign with Michael Cohen. We learned today that in addition to that partially open testimony next Wednesday, Felix Sater will also testify to Jerry Nadler's Judiciary Committee behind closed doors the following day, a week from tomorrow, next Thursday. The deputy chairman of President Trump's campaign, Rick Gates, who also served as the number two official in the Trump inaugural, his lawyers today told the Judiciary Committee that Rick Gates cannot at this point cooperate with their requests for information, but only because federal prosecutors have advised him that might be a bad idea. Quote, having received input from the various prosecution offices, I have concluded that for the time being, it is not in the interest of my client to provide testimony of documents to congressional investigators. Rick Gates, of course, is still awaiting sentencing on felony charges. Prosecutors said as recently as last week that his cooperation with prosecutors is still ongoing and it's still relevant to multiple pending and open investigations. So it's, it's not a huge surprise that with that open criminal case against Gates and with his involvement in all those other ongoing cases, it's not that much of a surprise that prosecutors are telling Gates that he shouldn't cooperate with congressional inquiries at this time while all those other matters are open. It's interesting, though. Even so, even with that, his lawyer also told the Judiciary Committee that that may soon change. Quote, our position in this regard may well be different in the coming months after Rick Gates presumably comes out the other side of his own criminal case and out the other side of his cooperation deal with the feds. CNN is reporting tonight that former White House communications director and longtime Trump Organization employee Hope Hicks also plans to cooperate with the Judiciary Committee in their inquiries. Hope Hicks and her attorney are not making any public comment, but the Judiciary Committee spokesman says tonight that Hope Hicks will be providing documents to their committee. AMI, the parent company of the National Enquirer supermarket tabloid that had a role in the hush money campaign finance felony scandal, uh, they're handing over documents to Congress. Mike Flynn's company, the Flynn Intel Group, they're also handing over documents to Congress. A former employee from Cambridge Analytica, the Trump data firm from the Trump campaign, they've, that employee has also reportedly shipped documents in in response to the committee's request. So, so lots of people and lots of entities who you might expect to put up a fight or maybe try to take the fifth or 
somehow try to make themselves scarce at this point. Lots of people who you might not expect to be cooperating are cooperating and they're sending in material. They're even meeting the deadline or getting close to it. But the White House is not doing any of that at all. The White House is thus far providing nothing to the Judiciary Committee in response to their requests. And more broadly than that, they are providing nothing in response to any congressional inquiries, not just about the Russia scandal and the obstruction of justice stuff that derives from the Russia scandal, but on anything. They're refusing to hand over a single document. Oversight Committee Chairman Elijah Cummings has just published this op-ed at the Washington Post, quote, I serve as chairman of the Oversight and Reform Committee, the primary investigative body in the House of Representatives. I have sent 12 letters to the White House on a half dozen topics, some routine and some relating to our core national security interests. In response, the White House has refused to hand over any documents or produce any witnesses for interviews. Let me underscore that point, he says. The White House has not turned over a single piece of paper to our committee or made a single official available for testimony during this Congress. Quote, the complete refusal by the Trump White House to produce any documents or witnesses to the primary investigative committee in the House reflects a decision at the highest levels to deny congressional oversight altogether. The president has dictated this approach. President Trump's actions violate our Constitution's fundamental principle of che checks and balances. If our committee must resort to issuing subpoenas, there should be no doubt as to why. And, and this is not just standard bickering <laughs> between the executive branch and Congress, the kind of stuff you see a little of, at least, in every administration. This is apparently a, a um, decision by the Trump administration that is a sort of an, an, a, a block decision. They're not making a case-by-case -case determination as to whether or not they're going to cooperate with this or whether they're going to cooperate with this or whether they'll hand over this document or whether they'll make this person available. This apparently is their, forgive me, stonewall decision on everything. No matter what the request, you will get nothing. And apparently this is the big new idea for this part of this presidency. They are rolling this out on purpose. Uh, deliberately, they're rolling out this storyline to multiple news organizations. This is how you ended up with all these headlines all over the place today that all said essentially the same thing. Trump officials prepared to stonewall Democratic oversight demands. White House ignores House panel's request for documents. The Washington Post today lays it out as clearly as anyone that this, this isn't just Capitol Hill fighting as usual. This is an intentional standoff being mounted by this White House in a way that no White House really ever has before. Quote, the White House has ignored more than a dozen letters requesting documents from House Democratic chairman investigating President Trump. The White House has refused to share emails and correspondence. According to two senior administration officials, the move is intentional. Quote, those officials who spoke on the condition of anonymity to freely discuss strategy said the White House is intent on challenging most, if not all, House Democrats document requests. We will give you nothing. They're not waiting to find out what they're being asked for. They're just announcing in advance, telling reporters, telling multiple news outlets in advance, no matter what they ask for, we're giving them nothing. And I am sure that is a strategy that appeals to every atom in every molecule in every cell of this president's body, right? I mean, this is like, this is, this fits his personality. Oh, the Democrats won control of Congress. They're going to use congressional oversight to oversee things, to investigate stuff I've done and this administration has done, to find stuff out? No, the answer is no. The answer is we will give you nothing. That's our final answer. You'll get zero from us. I am sure that kind of approach meets all of the emotional needs this president has around this issue in governance. The problem is, in America, this is not allowed. <laughs> I mean, this has been tested before. Never categorically the way this White House is trying to do it, saying we'll give you nothing on anything. But this has been tried before on specific stuff by an American president who tried this strategy not all that long ago. And very, very, very famously, it did not work out for that president. In this instance, the president has concluded that it would not serve the public interest to make the tapes available. 
Upon receipt of that letter, letter, Special Prosecutor Cox called a press conference and announced that he would use his subpoena power to try to get the tapes. Cox disagreed with the position taken by Mr. Nixon. The effort to obtain these tapes and other documentary evidence is the impartial pursuit of justice according to law. None of us should make assumptions about what the tapes will show. They may tend to show that there was criminal activity or that there was none. They may tend to show the guilt of particular individuals or their innocence. In a letter to Senator Sam Irvin, chairman of the Watergate Committee, the president said that the tapes fall into the category of presidential papers, which, as he has said before, the president won't turn over to another branch of government. And upon receipt of that letter, the Senate Watergate Committee met and unanimously voted to subpoena the tapes. Here's some of what Senator Irvin had to say. Upon our, the receipt of this uh, communication from the White House, the select committee held a meeting and unanimously voted to uh, authorize and direct uh, the chairman to issue two subpoenas, one re uh, requiring the president to produce the tapes, I love my country, I venerate the office of president. And I have uh, the best wishes for the success of the incumbent, present incumbent of that office because he's the only president this country has at this time. A president not only has constitutional powers which require him to see to it or to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, and I think it's his duty under those circumstances to produce information which uh, would either tend to prove or disprove that criminal activities have occurred. But beyond that, the President of the United States, by reason of the fact that he holds the highest office in the gift to the American people, owes an obligation to punish a high standard of moral leadership to this nation. The President owes it an obligation to furnish a high standard of moral leadership to this nation, Sam Irvin and the Watergate Committee. In 1973, President Richard Nixon tried to make history when he decided he didn't need to hand over to Congress anything he did not want them to see that pertained to Watergate, specifically the White House tapes that they had come to learn that the existence of. That forced a subpoena on the White House for those tapes. Nixon defied the subpoena. That ended up in court. The special prosecutor's demand for those materials, those tapes, ended up going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And, you know, this is really famous. <laughs> I mean, even, if, let's say you only know three things about Richard Nixon. What are the three things you know? You'd know, like, Nixon had to resign the presidency, had a dog named Checkers, <laughs> Supreme Court made him hand over the tapes, right? Like, even if you only know three things about Richard Nixon, even if you, even if you know nothing else about Richard Nixon, you know that unanimously, in U.S. v. Nixon, the president was not allowed to say, no, no, you can't have it. I say you can't. But that no, no, you can't have it policy today was rolled out by the Trump administration. They plan to give no documents, no materials, to make no witnesses available. And again, we'll see how that works out. Honestly, <laughs> in the courts, we know how it will work out. This has been tested before. This has been tried before. It doesn't work out well for a president who tries this. But in the meantime, while we are starting down the path to get there, in the meantime, if that is where this is heading, the speed at which this is all going to unfold and how everybody looks in the history books when it's all over will depend in large part on whether Republicans in Congress, members of the president's own party in Congress, can bring themselves to summon the energy to care about a president who is trying to not only do this to Democrats, but uh, trying to do this to them as well. Joining us now is the great Michael Beschloss, NBC News presidential historian. Michael, very happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Delighted, Rachel, always. Uh, I knew that I wanted you here tonight, and particularly in the A block, because I knew I was going to make assertions about presidential norms and history here mm -hmm. uh, for this context of what the, the Trump White House is rolling out right now. I need to just ask you to fact check me on a, a, a little bit on whether or not this is, in fact, something that Nixon tested and, and he lost that test. Yeah, Nixon tried it. You know, Nixon basically said to uh, the Congress, I'm not going to give up my tapes. I'm not going to give up related materials because they're protected by executive privilege, which 
covers, you know, deliberations within the executive branch and also separation of powers. And that went to a federal district court and they said they didn't have jur jurisdiction. So as you showed us, Archibald Cox, the special prosecutor and his successor, Leon Jaworski, went to court. They subpoenaed the tapes as well, went up through the system, went to the Supreme Court. And Nixon sort of cyn cynically thought maybe he's going to prevail on the court because he appointed four out of the nine justices of the Supreme Court, thought maybe they would do him a, fa a favor. It didn't work, of course. U.S. v. Nixon, July of 1974, eight to nothing. There was one who recused himself, who, which was William Rehnquist, who had served in the Nixon Justice Department. So if, if Donald Trump has been advised that this can go up through the courts and it'll go to a Supreme Court to which he has appointed Kavanaugh and Gorsuch, his two appointments might sort of defend him in the end. I think he'd better look back at Nixon and realize that history rhymes. In terms of um, the White House rolling this out explicitly, that's the other part of this that strikes me here. We are not at a point where there is a specific document that a lot of people believe may be a smoking gun right. that they're trying to pry out of the White House and the White House knows how damning it's going to be. I mean, this isn't exactly the same kind of standoff, the specific standoff they had exactly. over those White House tapes. We had testimony as to what was on the tapes. And we all wanted to hear the tapes. Everybody wanted... Th this is... The White House, in advance, broadly asserting that they are going to do this and telling right. reporters about it, putting out White House officials on the condition of anonymity to explain that this is a deliberate strategy and they want newspapers to write about it. And it strikes me in, in, in the Trump administration doing that, that they think that there will be some political benefit to them to taking this kind of black and white stance with, oh, the, I think with totally. the Democrats. Totally. I mean, it keeps his secrets, whatever secrets he's worried about that are in those documents and other materials. He figures that it's going to play to his base, who would love to see Trump standing up to Congress. And the other thing is that if the Mueller report is coming out soon, this is a big distraction. People might notice this constitutional crisis more than they notice what's in the Mueller report. But the other thing, Rachel, that's different from the Nixon period and also Iran-Contra, where Ronald Reagan actually cooperated quite a lot with Congress is that in the case of Reagan and Nixon, they at that point had to fear the very real, real possibility that they might uh, be impeached and convicted if it came to that. In Trump's case, he may just have calculated that the House is not going to impeach and he's got Republicans in the Senate and therefore the only thing he has to worry about is the courts and maybe has an undue, as I was saying earlier, feeling of complacency about how the Supreme Court might rule on this. Michael, when, when Nixon did pick this kind of fight over the White House tapes, uh, the Oval Office tapes back in 1973, um, did he expect that he would get support from his base, that he'd get, it, it would become a rallying point of support um, for, for, for Nixon supporters and for Republicans more broadly, that he was saying no to the Congress, that he was saying, no, you can't have these tapes. I mean, one of the things that strikes me looking back at the historical record was that unanimous bipartisan vote in the Watergate committee to issue right. a subpoena to the president for those things. I don't know what Republicans in Congress would do right now in the same sort of standoff that's evolving with this presidency. Right. But did Nixon think that Republicans would rally to him on this? In the end, he thought they would because, you know, he felt that party loyalty would be important. And he said actually privately about some of them, I can't believe he's turning against me. I campaigned for this guy. Hmm. Sort of a na naive point of view. But the other thing is that in 1973 and 1974, Nixon did not have coming to his aid something like Fox News. So that when this, you know, these developments began to turn against Nixon, the process was a lot more quick and he was disappointed. So instead, Nixon would make these pious pronouncements. I'm not giving up the tapes because they would compromise the ability of all future presidents to solicit confidential advice. People were not very impressed by the argument. Michael Beschloss, NBC News presidential historian, keeping us all honest every day. <laughs> Michael, Hi. thank you very much. Thank you. Happy spring, I hope. Oh, indeed. You, too, you as well, my friend. Thanks. All right. Um, coming up next, we broke a story here last night um, about the next trial, not the next indictment, not the next case, but the next trial that is expected that, to derive from the special counsel investigation. We've got an important update on that story for you next. Stay with us. 
Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.